Hello and welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. The word troubled seems to hardly begin to describe the now abandoned tender process for the overseas broadcaster, the Australian Network. Issued, reworked, then junked amidst leaks and accusations of an acrimonious, acrimonious relationship between the Prime Minister and the man she replaced, Kevin Rudd, Cabinet has now given the network to the ABC in perpetuity. The other bidder, Sky, is furious and the opposition's calling for an inquiry to be added to the AFP investigation and the look at the issue by the Auditor-General. Joining me to discuss this and other events of the day are Labor Senator Louise Pratt and Liberal MP Susan Lay. Welcome to you both. Hello. Hello. First to the tender process. The opposition says the process has been a shambles and Sky is pushing to be compensated, but the government's defending the final outcome and the ABC is happy. We'll have a listen to those. After much consideration, uh, to end all of the uncertainty, there are contracts, there are jobs that are, at, that are involved here. So to end the uncertainty, we decided to make the decision uh, yesterday and obviously uh, we announced that last night. A long and complex process. We've been waiting for a long time for it to be, resol to be resolved. It's been a long wait for our staff, but we're happy with the outcome. Others will judge and critique the process. Our challenge now is to think through what does it mean to offer this service in, in the time ahead. This uh, was a decision made at Cabinet last night. There was a Cabinet submission circulated, which uh, Minister Rudd, like all Cabinet ministers, received. Uh, can I just make the simple point about Cabinet processes? Uh, many ministers need to be away for, from a Cabinet meeting for a variety of reasons. The usual process is they ensure that their views are represented within the Cabinet room by the Minister acting on their behalf, and uh, that happened in this case. I'm not intending to go to Cabinet discussions, but the absolute usual protocols that an acting minister conveys the view of the minister who is necessarily absent happened in this case. Louise, do you have any understanding of how this process became so badly botched? Well, clearly there were some leaks that happened that really put the process off the rails. Notwithstanding that, I'm very happy with the decision that the government's made today to give uh, this uh, Australia network to the ABC. Do you think that, that that decision should have should have happened when you first came to government, that, that the process should not have been put out for a tender if it was eventually going to end up in the hands of the ABC in perpetuity? Well, clearly the government, uh, this government and previous governments under Howard had sought to really test the Australian network and have a look at whether it should go out to tender. Uh, the, the Labor government made a similar decision. Clearly, as has been much discussed, that process has come off the rails. Susan, uh, we'll, we'll talk to you about the tender process in a minute, but what do you think of the final outcome? Look, I have no problem with the ABC running the Australia network, nor would I have with Sky News. Each would have brought their particular strengths and good qualities to the process. We in the opposition have a real problem with the process, which is bad. The politics is bad. The public policy is bad. And it's actually really bad manners too. There's an AFP investigation into the leaks. There's also, the Auditor General is also having a look at it. Susan Lay, is there really a need for another inquiry on top of that? Well, I know that we need to get to the bottom of what really went on. And uh, Stephen Conroy, it's laughable, said he was ending the uncertainty. Uh, he created the uncertainty. If you announce a tender process, the point is that you don't know what the outcome is going to be at the end. And if somehow halfway through you decide that you want a particular outcome, uh, you shouldn't be engineering that. Now, this has gone on for 12 months cost the Australian taxpayer a lot of money. The compensation claim, if successful, will also be very expensive. So uh, it's a mess. It's symptomatic of the way this government does business. Louise, Sky has, has uh, started talking about compensation. Given the expense involved in this tender process, are they due some compensation given what they've been put through? I think it would be fair and reasonable that their claim be assessed, but clearly they need to be real costs attached to uh, their tender, uh, the, the failed tender process and what actual costs they were subjected to. So there, there will clearly be no false claims here. Susan, do you think, do you think uh, Sky should be compensated if, if they've got a case for, for, as Louise said, fair and reasonable compensation? 
Well, of course they should. I mean, nobody likes to see compensation awarded automatically, but look at what they've been put through in this ridiculous charade. And it is very expensive to tender. For something as long-term and substantial as the Australia Network, there would have been significant costs involved. Now, just because the Minister and the Prime Minister were embarrassed by Cabinet leaks along the way, uh, why should the taxpayer have to wear the cost and somehow be told that this is good public policy? It's not. It's keeping very bad faith with the Australian people. Louise, if I could go to the question of those leaks, there's a lot of suggestions that they are a result of, of effectively the continuing damaging fallout of the challenge to Kevin Rudd, his ousting as Prime Minister. There was a lot of talk that he preferred the Sky Tender as a Foreign Affairs Minister. Is this part of the, part of the continuing fallout that, that your party just hasn't managed to stem? I would vehemently disagree with that. What we know is that there were, damage, there were leaks in relation to the tender process and that that is most unfortunate. We regret that, but I would suggest it has nothing to do with uh, those, uh, those kinds of issues. Susan, there, there are leaks all the time in government. There were leaks under the Howard government. There were leaks in governments before that. Uh, can, you really, can you really guess as to the motivations behind the leaks when, when we don't really know where they came from? Well, no, Lyndall, there are not leaks all the time. There are not leaks from Cabinet all the time. We don't have a persistent leaker generally in the cabinets of Australian governments. So I'm not pointing the finger at anyone because how would I know? But this tender has been seriously compromised, not just by the leaks, but by the ridiculously uh, bumbling handling of the minister and the prime minister. And suddenly to uh, release the result last night uh, and say they were ending the uncertainty after a couple of weeks before that saying they were going to redo the process, uh, it only adds injury to ridicule. Uh, it is appropriate that we have an inquiry and that we get to the truth of this because there is poor public policy and a lot of government dollars allocated to an effectively wasted process. If we could turn now to the issue of same-sex marriage, Susan Lay, there are uh, some of your Liberal Party colleagues who think that there should be a conscience vote in the Liberal Party on this issue, particularly to allow front benches to express their, their conscience, their deeply held view when, when the issue comes before Parliament. Do you agree that this issue should be the subject of a conscience vote in your party? Look, I haven't made up my mind on that. Um, there are arguments why it should be a conscience vote and arguments why it should not. I don't think we should be frivolous about what are matters of conscience and what are matters of the law. And until we see some legislation rolled out, and I can actually eyeball it, in black and white, I'm not sure that I can meaningfully come up with an answer. Um, the perspective that I come from is, is a determination that we don't have discrimination in this area, a determination that young men and women in the rural towns that I represent can grow up, uh, if they're same-sex attracted, not feeling that anyone in any way is against them. And, uh, but I also recognise that this is a technical legal issue. Marriage is between a man and a woman at this stage under Australian law. But what I am going to do in the next few weeks, and what I have been doing in the last few months, is talking to my constituents. I've conducted surveys, I've met many different couples and um, had numerous letters and emails that I've responded to personally. So I'm very keen to hear from the people that I represent not so much from the people everywhere else in Australia, and we are all getting overwhelmed with the correspondence at the moment. But uh, I'm here to represent the seat of Farah, and uh, I hope to do that properly. So, so is it fair to say you haven't made up your mind which way you would vote if the legislation comes before Parliament, if the private members' bill comes before Parliament? It is fair to say that I haven't made up my mind which, which way to vote, and nor have I made up my mind whether it's appropriate that we have a conscience vote on this. And I know that that may sound to viewers like a cop-out, but it's not, because when the time comes, I'll be very definite about what I believe, and I'll state my reasons, and I will have taken a great deal into account. But most particularly, I will have seen the black and white uh, law, uh, proposed legislation, and able to make judgments accordingly. Louise, do you think it's the case that at... at this point in time that if a private member's bill is put before the parliament it simply doesn't have the numbers to allow it to pass? 
It's a very real question what members of the opposition are allowed to do in relation to this vote. I would think, uh, given the views of the Australian people, which is that the majority of them do support marriage equality, that that is the view that would emerge from the parliament if indeed all parliamentarians across the party spectrum are given the ability to vote according to their conscience and indeed according to their electorate's views. It, there may be a difference though between what an MP might personally think and what their electorate might be telling them. How do you weigh the balance of those differences? Well, I will be encouraging uh, people who have been affected by this discrimination to go and talk to their MPs because I know that MPs like Susan are listening to their constituents on this issue. Uh, the, the reason there's such strong, such strong support for marriage equality in Australia is that these days most people know someone who's been affected by this discrimination. Susan, do you think there's, there's a, a balancing act to be done if it comes to a question of a conscience vote between an MP's personal view and what their voters are telling them? Or, or does what your electorate wants always win out? Look, there is always a balancing act, and I know that some of the votes we've had in the past around, for example, RU486 uh, was very fraught in the parliament, but everyone that watched that process was confident that people spoke both from the perspective of their own feelings, but they also took into account the feelings of their constituents. So there perhaps is a little bit of both in a conscience vote, but I think it's a little bit rich of Louise to say it depends what the Liberal Party is allowed to do. Remember that in the Liberal Party, if we cross the floor, uh, we're still in the Liberal Party. If uh, Louise crosses the floor, she's no longer in the Labor Party. And that has been an important factor in why the Labor, Labor Party Council on the weekend has determined the course of action that it does. So I don't really want to get political about this and I, and I know that people who have passions in the area don't want to see us get political. But remember that we do have the option in the Liberal Party of crossing the floor and Labor Party members don't. Although your front bench is bound by a decision, the Shadow Cabinet's bound by a decision of the Shadow Cabinet, isn't it? If a, if a Shadow Cabinet member wants to cross the floor, they have to quit their front bench job, don't they? Uh, look, that is possibly the case. Uh, to be honest, I haven't seen it happen. But the important thing is that people on our side of politics are, in the next few weeks, going to talk very strongly within our own party room and with our, within our own communities, both in terms of the political views that we represent and also in terms of our constituencies about this issue. Louise, is there a chance that having such a focus on the issue of same-sex marriage may get in the way of dealing with the other di discriminations which do exist in the gay community, in the transgender community and the intersex community? Well, we've actually made good progress as a result of the National Conference on some of those other questions, and we've also made good progress as a government. We've recently removed discrimination in the issuing of passports, and the Attorney-General is currently looking at the kinds of discrimination that exists for transgender people, much of which needs to be coordinated through the states in order to fix those problems. So um, I would say that this is hardly a distraction. It's a significant and very symbolic sign that the Australian Labor Party does stand for equality. And that's where we'll have to leave it. Louise Pratt and Susan Lay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please join us at the same time tomorrow.